Welcome back to Death Watch's Call of Cthulhu campaign, Descent into Darkness Season 2. I am Travis, and I will be your keeper today. And I am joined by the usual suspects, so I guess we'll start with Brandon. Go ahead and introduce yourself and your character, please. Hello, I'm Brandon, playing Dr. Wallace Andrews, a Harvard-trained medical doctor who um, first became aware of the possibility of strange and supernatural on a trip to Peru and now I'm back in uh, Boston investigating a strange case of Mr. Dooley and next we got Justin and I'm playing Lance Monroe who has always had a, a fascination with the occult and led him to his profession as a talkative and gregarious museum curator of the occult and I'm John, I'm playing James Whitmire, um, who is hoping to turn his luck around over the past, or from what it's been over the past, what, week or so? Right, yeah. And today's story will begin with old Slick Jim Whitmire, who always seems to be just one step ahead of those who are out to get him. So, in recent hours, you've escaped the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight with the help of your compatriots as Sergeant Logan Terry was asking after you and you had set up a ruse that gave him the belief you had left Boston when in fact you hadn't and you took a room at the Omni Parker House which was near the train station as you are waiting to depart to Arkham and it's in the Omni Parker, Parker House where you're making yourself comfortable uh, you know, taking your jacket off, and I guess going to while away the rest of the evening until sleep takes you, when you realize that there's a shape in your jacket, and you see that you have the paperback copy of Nameless Cults still there. Now, Mr. Whitmire, did you want to spend the rest of this evening reading this book? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll uh... You know, set my jacket aside, and when I see it, I'll pick it up and dig it out and start looking at the front and the back. And you had said that the cover was torn off of this, is that right? No, it's just tattered, like um, like it has been well read. Uh, you can see there's parts where it is in danger of tearing, but yeah, it was well read, which is odd because it wasn't even on the bookshelf. It was on top of the bookshelf, but anyhow, there it is. Okay. And... Uh, at a glance, you can see the publisher does not do quality work. Like, the typeset is misaligned. And, you know, just reading the opening paragraph, you pick out a number of typos and um, grammatical errors and that sort of thing. And they're, they don't have as much copyright information as you're used to seeing in other books. But uh, if you want to comprehend what you're reading, I actually need a language English role. Pull my character sheet up. Give me just a moment. Where is that listed under? So I believe it's in the middle column of the skills tab. And it should say languages own because I see you're, it. you're right. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'll put, can I, or not push uh, luck that? <laughs> you may. Yes. All right. I'll spend the one luck to make it a success. Okay. Let me share the book with you. All right, so that's just a little bit of information on the book. It's written in English, although, you know, poor grammar, bad spelling. I, I don't see anything. I think nothing no. had popped up. I'm looking through the... It should be other in a folder called see, Mythos Tomes. Maybe I can force it. No? There it goes. So, yeah, from what little information they have as far as copyright information goes, it just says... Uh, translator unknown. The publishing date's 1909. 
and it says simply a version of the Bridewell text published by Golden Goblin Press, New York. And as you read through it, you realize the book is written in the first person, and that person names themselves as Frederick Wilhelm von Juntz. And you can also pick up by other details that he's a German, although he's in different parts and in different parts of a story. And it, it reveals itself to be sort of a personal exploration with his connections to various cults and secret societies. And uh, you can do what's called a skim reading with the time you have. But and let me share. What does that accomplish? Well, you um, say if this were an occult tome, if you finished a skim reading, you might get an increase to your occult skill. If it were like a history book that was relatively rare, by finishing a reading, it would increase your skill. If it's a mythos tome, it will increase your increase your Cthulhu mythos rating as well as lose sanity. So I, I will give you a heads up as you're kind of reading through it. Most of it's been sort of nonsensical and a little far-fetched, although with your experiences, not that far-fetched. But as you're working your way through the appendices, which is, you know, little odds and ends that don't really fit into the chapters he's laid out ahead, the hair on the back of your neck and your arms starts to raise as it seems to veer into familiar territory. So I'll allow you to put the book down at this stage if you wish, but nothing will be gained. Well, so I think that I will continue. <laughs> so I want to, I mean, if it's something that, that I'm recognizing from the Peru thing, then I definitely want to see if I could figure out anything more about that mask. Uh, yes, it does seem to strike on that a little bit. Now, let me paste it in there for you. One sec. Okay. So this is the particular passage that has some meaning to you. And uh, it's found in the appendices in a section called Manifestations of Chaos, the Creator and the Destroyer, in which Von Juntz says, or writes, There is a figure a dark figure whose pattern I have detected in many smaller cults across the world. He is known by many blasphemous names and many tongues, and is a driver of Faustian bargains and innovator of strange, wondrous inventions with equally horrible unintended consequences. Or sometimes an idiot deity who exemplifies one ideal or urge above all others. While on its surface this might appear as another manifestation of Satan, there is a distinct difference. Whereas Satan is the persona of arrogant intellect, the belief in God or nature, and the willful turning from him under the presumption that intellect alone can produce something better than creation, this other figure is not bound up in Christianity or any known religion, save perhaps the darkest of pagan practices. Instead, it seems to represent the ineffable joy found in the descent into nihilism, an explicitly separate idea from achieving the state of nihilism. There are certain strange accounts of this figure acting as a savior repeatedly, but only insofar as it serves to create something new to destroy, like a child might stack wooden blocks for the sole purpose of toppling them and watching the cascade of destruction. He or she or it has been called the black man, the black whore, the dark one, the horned one, the father of maggots, the haunter of the dark, the angelet, ageless stranger, the wisdom from the stars, the lunar bird or loony bird, and many more. If this entity has a definable goal, it cannot be ascertained from the chaos it creates or the fact that its manifestations, whether human appearing or monstrous in description, often work at cross purposes. For example, third dynasty Egyptian ruler Djoser began to build many great works with the help of Imhotep, who some believed to be a version of the black man, else how would his designs and medicines be so advanced? Some centuries later, amidst an Egypt resplendent with many pyramids and buildings with supporting columns and other architectural marvels, the figure returns, this time as the mysterious black pharaoh, who oversees the decline of the old kingdom, which leads directly to the first intermediate period with all its famine and civil wars. In England, I discovered a coven of witches who worshipped a being they called the Great Horn One, 
who I believe is yet another manifestation of this figure. With some difficulty, I convince them to teach me the necessary rites, which I shall now inscribe here in ancient Aklo. One must purify themselves of both food and drink for a day and a night, and intone the words into the mirror world. Then a small blood sacrifice must be made, painting horns on the mirror and the supplicant's own blood. Then he shall appear, the great horned one, as a black horned man, not a black man, but a man of blackness such that he is literally blacker than night, but with blazing eyes. The witches that taught me this had all carved their names in his book of the sun, in exchange for blasphemous ability. For my own part, as a seeker of knowledge, I only asked for enlightenment, and was so shown such twirling vistas and gulfs of time and damned landscapes and starry wisdom as to be forever altered. But take heed, woe to they that look directly on the great horn one, woe to they that break their pact with him. So as you, you know, finish with that internal vocalization in your mind, there are several things that harken back to your experience in Peru, this talk of the mirror world, the talk of Faustian bargains, some of the names he's gone by. Was the father you interacted with the same as the father of maggots? Uh, Monroe might be able to answer that question, but he's not here right now. <laughs> and in any case, uh, give me, or actually you don't get a sanity roll for this one. So you lose 2d8 sanity. Holy Jeez. moly. Ouch. Well, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> I'm almost completely sane, though, so I'll be all right. <laughs> That Still. puts me at 80 out of 97. Yeah, that's like 10% right there, one shot. Well, I, yeah, so physically, like as I'm I'm reading this, so, you know, hands begin to, to shake a bit. It's, uh, you know, sweating even though the room is a decent temperature. And, yeah, at the end, I'll, uh, you know, just grab the, the, or close the book and kind of toss it away. Um, over to like a side table or nightstand if there is one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let me give you another detail that's made it more hair raising. Is you know while you're thinking of the gold mirror and this mirror world, you're you've not been wanting to look at it ever since you've made this connection and you've tossed the book. But in your room is a big mirror on a dresser. Uh, you have the image in your head. It had gilding around the edges of it. Uh, dare you look up? At the reflection there, Mr. Whitmire? Let's see. <laughs> I'm trying to look for something appropriate to roll. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it'll be more of an unconscious thing, though, right? Like, or I, maybe that's the wrong word, but just, you know, something that I can't help myself. Like, you, you know that you shouldn't. You know, like if you're walking down a uh, dimly lit street late at night and, you know, you, you feel someone behind you. Is you don't want to make it true by looking, because that's that's more of it. But slowly, as your head starts to turn around. So, as I raise my head to the mirror and look in. Yes, and there in the reflection behind you, behind the bed, in the passageway between the bathroom and the main area, is a figure, a dark figure, so black that it seems to suck the light from the rest of the room, and his eyes blaze with not the light fire or anything like that, but maybe the light of a star or the sun, and around its head is an incomplete halo that looks like a pair of horns, and his voice, a whisper in the room, has the sound of like grease hitting a hot skillet, and it asks you, Mr. Whitmire, do you think you can run from a god? And everything goes black, but you gain three percentile in your Cthulhu Mythos skill. So do do I roll that? No, or? no. You gain you you increase oh, the Cthulhu okay. mythos. I see what you're saying. By three points, which also lowers your maximum sanity by the same three points. A double sanity hit. Not your current value. It's your max beginning is ninety nine. Oh, uh, so minus it, your, it lowers my max sanity. Yeah, your max sanity is ninety nine minus uh -oh. your current mythos rating. Yeah, I had a ninety seven. So now I'm down right. to. 94. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we'll uh, fade on the scene with Mr. Whitmire. I still and failed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, have you been, have you 
Because you're temporarily insane right now. You've never been driven temporarily insane no, before, right? I haven't. I've always been able to keep my your yeah my stuff together. So as a bonus, you get a uh, additional five to your Cthulhu Mythos. Oh, nice. So it should be a total of eight from this encounter. All right. So leaving you with your encounter in the Omni Parker Hotel, we zoom across Boston to where Mister. Monroe and Dr. Andrews have just finished watching a woman, the good wife, <laughs> Detective Nichols, vomit an immense amount of buttons of different shapes and sizes, some made of metal, some of wood. You even see a thimble in there. Um, what would you like to do, Dr. Andrews? Yeah, so I need to immediately leap into action and do an examination of her, make sure that She's not still choking or that she has internal bleeding, take her pulse and all that doctor stuff. Right. So you can use either like, first aid or medicine, whichever one you like. Um, well, we'll do first aid for now. Okay. Uh, did you want to let that roll stand or th can you think of a way to push it or did you want to use some luck? Yeah, I'll use luck. Okay, so that ensures you have a regular success so you run your you know your hands over her you get you know her heart rate which is elevated but not dangerously so you look into her eyes and she seems plenty alert you know you uh tenderly run your hands over her stomach and everything is you know soft it doesn't seem like there's any blockages in there which is what you're most concerned about given the amount of non-edible substances she ate that would, her body wouldn't have been able to digest. But yeah, all told, she does seem to be doing well at the moment. And you would count it as a stroke of luck that she is with what she was eating. Except for all the internal bleeding from the uh, buttons that she shaved off on the side. Right. But in this case, she does seem to be fine without uh, a longer examination. Um, okay. Well, I... Uh... I guess then I would just um, tell her, you, you seem to be okay despite this, um, but I I feel compelled as a medical professional to advise against eating uh, or, yeah, swallowing these sorts of items. Yeah, she um, stammers out a few beginnings to phrases, like sh she says, uh, I don't... Uh... I can't. And finally, she sits back down in her seat and puts her head in her, her hands and, you know, starts weeping there. And it's at this point that Detective Nicholas has finally broken out of this odd state you've been watching, uh, Miss, or, yeah, Mr. Monroe, where he continued to shovel the expert, expertly prepared roast into his mouth. And uh, finally, some concern for his wife wipes that away and he gets up to go to her side. Uh, what's your move on all this? Uh, for right now, I'm just going to be observing. Um, since the uh, detective really isn't, I don't know, expressing concern like I would expect him to, I'm just kind of watching the situation. Um, would there be like a psychology role or something like that to know of some sort of uh, mental condition that would cause someone to eat buttons and stuff like that? Yeah, why don't you guys both throw psychology rolls out for me? Uh, you can assess the husband and... Nope. Okay. No, I cannot. Well, you're, I, in your case, Mr. Monroe, you're not sure. Maybe it was just such an unexpected, shocking turn of events that it took a while for his brain to catch up. Uh, you know, some men have stronger appetites for food than others. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and... For you, Dr. Andrews, you know that her reaction at this stage is that she is just completely mortified. Like that these are, this is tears of embarrassment. And, uh, and Detective Andrews sort of moves you out of the way, shoulders you aside so he can attend to his wife. But she's unresponsive towards him as well. You know, when he asks her, like, what, what have you been eating? The buttons from your sewing kit? What is this? Yeah. So I was hoping. With my psychi psychology role, if I'd ever read any sort of 
mental afflictions that cause this sort of thing? Well, psychology in this game is not, it doesn't re- represent like the, like the academic category of knowledge. It's, it's a, a sense that you have about people that, you know, like the sixth sense, it goes beyond what you can see. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So it's, it's your spot hidden, but for people's moods. Yeah. So then the skills that, that must be what psychoanalysis is for then. Right. Yeah. And okay. I've, and I think last time you did, you failed a hard medicine role mm-hmm. uh, to come up with that information. Now it's not too late that you can't push it. If you can think of some way to do that, no, that's okay. I just, um, I guess I would, I would be trying to determine what I should do at this point, but I'd be at a loss because I, I'm just not aware of any, you know, medical history related to eating, in it, you know, these sorts of non-food items. So, so I'm going to kind of try and break the tension a little bit by beginning to kind of clean up a little bit of the table and starting a discussion in my usual manner about, you know, what's for dessert. Hopefully it's not buttons and thimbles. So, yeah, I'll, I'll spout out as I start folding up the tablecloth over, you know, the vomit and that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. well, I well, I applaud you on your, your uh, ability to try new foods. Perhaps these ones did not agree with you. And, you know, the roast was a most excellent roast. Uh, Perhaps, perhaps it's time for dessert and coffee, though. As long as you know it doesn't include the, your uh, recent proclivity for uh, dining on non-standard food items. Why don't you give me a charm roll? We'll see how it lands with everybody. Uh oh, where is my charm? You lost that long ago. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> So it goes about as well as you expect, and I'm kind of interested to see what, <laughs> how Dr. Andrews uh, would respond to this sort of inappropriate jesting about it. <laughs> like the Detective Nichols gives you like a WTF look, like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was kind of expecting that. Uh, yeah, so I uh, uh, come now. Uh, obviously, this is been an embarrassing incident let's just try and forget all about it and not draw any more attention to it and then I'll, so like then i'll just try to change the subject which is what what i see he was trying to do but failed miserably at so. yep yeah detective nichols does ask you like well, the, should we take her to the hospital or or is she going to be okay what what should we do doctor well i think she's fine i've done a cursory exam and her airways not blocked and she seems alert um just a little embarrassed and i think the best thing now would be just to uh, put it behind us oh right you are we don't we don't want to have to you know have her wallow in it so honey yeah, why don't so you go ahead like i'll just like grab you know whatever napkins or whatever they have on the table and just like clean up that mess just to get it out of sight, you know. But yeah. Didn't Justin, start folding up the uh, tablecloth. Yeah, right. I started folding the tablecloth over the whole, the whole mess. Yeah. So uh, with Still Andrew's help, it on their kitchen floor. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're able to c- carry pretty much the whole mill, you know, into an adjacent room, and uh, Detective Nichols has has uh, moved his wife into the study, you know, where he had first poured the drinks for you and whatnot and has had her lie down on a couch and he comes back into the dining area and he's at a loss for words he's like i i don't know what to say gentlemen i i really am at a loss here but i do know we were discussing important matters i'm not sure to what degree i'll be able to think straight but i suppose if there was more to be said we could carry on uh give me a minute i'm gonna need another drink i think and he gives sort of a longing look at the uh kitchen door and your for your part mr monroe you wonder if that's a longing look at the uh, departed roast but in any case yeah he pours himself a big drink and offers you guys one and then waits quietly for for any further discussion 
Yeah, I'm gonna decline this time. Okay. Yeah, he raises the his eyebrow and a and the decanter at you, Doctor Andrews. Yeah, I'll have one. <laughs> I think you guys have been drinking, you know, fairly regularly since like noon today. But <laughs> well, it, it was the twenties. Everybody did. Right. That. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, and the they button. started at five a.m. like a real yeah. man. Went yeah, till three a, at three a.m. the next day. <laughs> Right, so yeah, he's uh, awaiting any further, further discussion. What? Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just like, I'll wait for like a minute with the assumption that the silence will force Lance to begin speaking, and that <laughs> he might be able to get the discussion rolling in a different direction. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll spark back up and say, well. Uh, I am going to be heading up north to uh, Arkham University. Do you have any contacts up there that I might be able to to use? Well, Arkham is something in the investigation drawn you up there. Yes, the uh, some of the symbols that were drawn during the uh, murder have led me to believe that it has some relations to a cult uh, and some underground movements that may have been related to the Dooley House investigation. Not the Dooley House, the what's Corbett the House. House. Corbett House. Corbett. Corbett House. Oh well, that's fascinating. Unfortunately, I don't have any connections in Arkham. I've actually never been there except passing through. And my good man, what what kind of uh, experience do you have with with the occult and various you know ancient deities and whatnot, even as a passing curiosity? Well, none, to be perfectly honest. I. Uh, part of the attraction of the Hermetic Order of the Silver Twilight was their extensive occult library. You know, I just haven't had much time in recent months to really dig in and peruse what's contained there. Have you found anything interesting in their library? Um, there are a few books of, of great interest to me, but no, my, my question to you is more based on on the, the idol that I saw that you have on your mantle that, you know, has some occultish ties to it. Or at, least, at the very least, appears to. Oh, yes, that thing. You know, I'm not really sure. Uh, I was, you know, in at the police station one day, and I came to my desk, and there it was. And I was going to throw it out, but, you know, Fiona, my dear wife, she has a affinity for frogs. She was a biology major in university. So I brought it home thinking she would likely like it. It's somewhat ghastly, though, if you ask me. And Monroe, there there are certain markers about it that your archaeology skill might illuminate more about it. Okay, yeah, I'll I'll toss that out. Congratulations, hard success. Yeah. So you think that this is a actually a prehistoric Native American artifact? And let me uh, clarify that in this case, prehistoric as a term would mean it's pre-written history. So this could be you know, maybe only like 400 years old or something like that before European settlers got there okay. uh, to where that, to where this artifact is from. And you think it's uh, from a group of people that are sometimes referred to as the Spiro Mound Builders, or maybe even earlier. It's carved from flint, but it's in remarkable condition. You think that it was probably buried somewhere, maybe in one of the mounds that they were famous for you know, forbearing. Yeah. And um, they, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no keep going. Oh, you, uh, those people were, they were known as the Cadoan Mississippian group. So that gives you a rough idea to the region that How they, do you spell that? Cadoan? It's C A D D O A N. And that term covers like a large number of, you know, individual tribes. Okay. So like Cherokees would be descendant from or within that group of people, among others. Okay. So yeah, I'll I'll kind of mention, you know, that you know, this frog statue comes from, you know, an ancient civilization that was first here in, in the United States. And you know, I had I'd studied them when I was uh in college and seeking my archaeology degree. And if you don't have any particular you know, attachment to it, it would make a wonderful piece in my museum. Um, I'd be willing to compensate you for it, of, of course. Oh, you know, I actually take it. I 
have been meaning to get rid of it when Fiona is otherwise occupied, but uh, it always seems to slip my mind. Well, now is as good a time as any, so if yeah, you don't so, mind. Yeah, go for it. And w- when you get your hands on it and, you know, you turn it around a few more times, you would uh, give a rough estimate of age being between the 9th and 15th centuries. Okay. A.D. But, you know, nothing uh, magical happens when you pick it up. <laughs> I know. That's what you were waiting for. It, no, no. It was, it's just part of his... Uh his proclivity to try and continue to find right. interesting things for his museum. Hold on a sec. Did I uh, did I share the handout on that one with all you guys? Uh, what was it under? It's called Strange Idol. Strange Idol. Uh, I yeah, I did. yeah, I see a pi- yeah, I see the picture. Yeah, I remember. It's under Dooley it. handouts. Yeah. yeah, so it it looks like that. Um, it's roughly you know six to eight inches in height. It has a good few pounds of heft to it but it fits quite easily. Well, you know, with it fits well in most inside pockets of jackets, you know, it, it's sticking like halfway out, but it slides right in there pretty nice. Okay. Yeah, of course, I'll I'll thank him heartily. How do, you, do you think it's worth much, I suppose I should ask, before I let it out of my sight? Uh, as far as its value, uh, as far as I know, these things were somewhat common down more towards the Mississippi region, the how it managed to make it onto your desk is uh, a question that I w- would love to have answered because these are the kinds of idols that that uh, make great attractions for my museum. Uh, as for its monetary value, uh, to the right collector, if you find them, then they could have some value, but I wouldn't consider it something along the lines of a Tutankhamun artifact of Egyptian quality or things of that nature. Yeah, as an additional detail, one of the ways you might think it have, it would have found itself this way is you think the area it came from, a lot of that property was sold to private enterprises and they were less than tender mm. with the excavations of what you would consider to be archeo- archaeological sites. So okay. they probably just gathered them up, you know, pawned them off somewhere and then it traveled from wherever to here. Yeah. Still the question of how it ended up directly on his desk out of nowhere is kind of surprising. Yeah, you know, I thought, you know, maybe, because I've only been here in Boston a year and a half now, I thought, I don't know, maybe it was some sort of hazing ritual I didn't understand. Okay. But I don't understand what they, what joke they would be trying to make. You know, because Detective Nichols isn't like a portly man or there's nothing really vaguely toad-like about him at all. If you were to compare him to any animal, it would, it would be more fox-like. Okay. And uh, Doctor Andrews, are you you certain? You, are you certain I shouldn't take Fiona to the hospital? Um, I I don't think that there's any need to rush her there, but I do advise that that she make an appointment with her doctor and discuss this with him. And I certainly don't mean any offense, but um, you might need to seek the help of. Uh, psychological professionals in case there's some underlying disorder causing her to consume these sorts of items. Is there it's such a thing? not my area of expertise, but um, we're, what we're looking at here was a, a large amount of uh, various non-food items. Um, so it, it just is not normal behavior. All right. Well, I appreciate your opinion and I We'll look into it. Um, sorry, I can't direct your guys' investigation any further. It seems like you do have a few good places to start. You know, I was, I don't know if I made it plain before all this happened, but considering how my investigation has been stonewalled and it appears there are people watching your movements, I would just encourage you to try to come at it from angles and uh, feel free you decide you want to look into a particular thing to contact me and maybe we can, you know, think up a way to approach it that won't make it so obvious to those who are watching for whatever reason they are watching. Um, Makes me feel like an insane person to think that people are doing that, but that does seem to be what the case is. Hey, did we ask him about uh, his partner last time? Uh, In fact, I don't see it in my notes. No, you didn't. That's what I want to bring up is like your your 
former partner? No, he's still partner? my partner. He's currently away in Salem on another case following up a lead there. But yeah, he's still my partner. Um, and this is a different guy than the one that was at the, um, the lodge looking for Whitmire? Yeah, his partner is Detective Fallon. Oh, that's right. Okay. And what? so you, this is where you found the journal, right? Yeah, I found a journal and then a check as well that seems to come from, uh, the heck is his name? Yeah, Francis so I, Walsh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have that, so I want to show Detective Nichols that. Yeah, the, I thought I had um, seen that at his apartments, the journal. You know, I don't know what to make of it now that it's confirmed it actually was there. I um, have never entirely had a good feeling about the man, and seeing he's got money here, I don't know what to make of this FW. I'll have to think on that for a moment, but this Frank Bellencamp, the person who signed the check, actually, I I believe he's a lawyer. I uh, Pardon me, I don't remember the firm he works for, but... I've seen his name in the, the docket at the courthouse quite often. Oh, that's it. In connect, Yeah, F.W., Francis Walsh. He represents some guys that are known associates of Francis Walsh. Yeah, that's. What I think that's, I mean, F.W., there's probably a lot of F.W.'s, but if this is him being paid off, that would be my guess. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. He has a pretty bad reputation. I, I would exercise extreme caution if you decide that, to look into that connection with Francis Walsh. They call him the sweetheart, but as I understand it, that's sort of tongue-in-cheek. He's anything, you know, anything else but a sweetheart. I see. I wonder if he was involved in sending the two goons to warn me off of the case. Uh, did you get their names? Uh, no. Did I? I don't think I did. Um, well, I can't recall. So, Because yeah, normally <laughs> when I go and threaten somebody, I tell them what my name is. Right. Yeah. yeah, they probably didn't mention it. Well, there's we have a couple of mug shots. I might be able to get those out with arousing too much suspicion. You know, like he, uh, Francis Walsh's stomping grounds are Charlestown. So I could get the mug shots for his known associates and we could confirm that if you happen if you happen to be able to identify them as the ones who, who accosted you the other day. Yeah. Where would you like me to send that? Um, well, I guess to the to the lodge because I should be back there after I'm done at the sanitarium. Okay. I'll do that. Well, gentlemen, if there's nothing else, I, I think I really need to attend more to my wife and uh, yeah. Good detective. Uh, Please allow me to uh, at the very least apologize for my uh, <laughs> colorful jest earlier. I truly did not mean to embarrass her. Oh, no, that's all right. It, it was an unusual situation. I'm not I'm not sure anybody was thinking in the correct order. <laughs> I still <laughs> and, don't know if I am. And if you if you don't mind, as, as part of being an, a good guest, I would like to help you clean up the, the mess that was left by it as well. No, no, that won't be necessary. I will Please, summon... please, I insist. They've got a girl for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm actually like doing this to see like how he reacts to to being around the roast that she had vomited on. I'm a little bit concerned about his obsession with it. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, and, you... I, and I wanted to make sure that she wasn't, like, going into the other room and then gobbling down a bunch of buttons and, and other crap. So I'm, I'm trying to use it as a pretense to, to go and check on her and, and, you know, watch his mannerisms as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, you you follow him to help him clean up and... You know, you move into the kitchen to sort through that mess. And she's actually in a separate room, so you don't get to see much of her. But yeah, in fact, when you guys are going through that stuff, he does it almost absentmindedly as he's moving this platter with the partially devoured roast on it. But he's just picking parts of it off and stuffing them in his mouth. And even one that might, you know, cause your you to have your gag reflex to go into effect. He, uh, there's a part with some of the fluid that the buttons were in the bile that was on the roast that he actually sticks in his mouth and uh, actually give me a constitution roll. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is... <laughs> hey, there oh, you okay. Go. Okay. Yeah. I was a little bit worried about that one. 
Yeah. So you feel, you know, that sound we're all familiar with, you uh, feel that <laughs> rising up, you know, in your esophagus there, but you cut it off before it can make a sound, you know, that retching sound and uh, you steal yourself. But uh, anyhow, there you but are. You don't ask for a bite. <laughs> Didn't roll low enough to <laughs> or succeed. Uh, no, but when I see that, that, I I will I will bring up his his obsession with it, and you know I'll say that did that did not look like it was uh, sufficiently cleaned off for human consumption. Are you are you sure that that everything's all right with you, sir? Uh, pardon me, Mister Monroe. What are you talking about? Let's pause right there for one second. Uh, Andrews, Fiona Nichols comes in to offer you an apology. She's composed herself, and now she seems to be more in an explanatory mood. And she relates an anecdote from about three weeks ago <laughs> when she was just sitting there, you know, repairing one of her husband's jackets, you know, attaching a button to it. And before... She could really think about it. She popped the button, you know, the unattached button into her mouth and swallowed it. And she was as surprised as anyone would be when it happened. But she confides in you that she felt such relief in the way of satiating hunger that she couldn't help herself in subsequent time sewing that she would just almost absentmindedly eat these things. And um, what do you think that is, doctor? No, it's a big quite honest. You know, doctors are not supposed to say this, but I have no idea. Pinch you crazy, did, lady. I did recommend to your husband that you make an appointment with, uh, you know, a, a, what do they call them? Like a psychological professional and see if perhaps there's something that he might know that could help you uh, avoid this sort of thing. Because this is quite dangerous. Some of these items that you swallow could cause severe damage. Do you Think they'll have to commit me? Oh, I don't. I don't think that would be necessary. You don't seem to be a danger to others, and you seem to, you know, be aware of who you are and where you are and what's going on. But there might be some medication that could help. Well, I I will look into it. Thank you, Doctor. It's just been such a strange last few weeks. Uh, I've had this thing going on, and I almost didn't want to admit it to myself, but I suppose it's. Uh, out in the open now, and my husband just, you know, it's the same meal every night with him, and, and uh, you know, one night when he was sleeping, he woke up, and as if from a nightmare, it startled me awake, and I asked him about it. You know, what he described didn't sound very nightmarish. It was just like a low mound or a hill in the distance with a, a windmill in the foreground, but he, he said it felt him, or it filled him with such dread that it woke him from his dream, and then, I don't know if it was him telling me about it or what, but I had the very same dream the next night, and that's all within the last few weeks. Is, is this, could this be the result of some kind of virus or something? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. The virus generally wouldn't cause shared dreams, but, um, you know, loneliness, and it's a, it's a big house, and, and he said, he relayed to me that you haven't had time to you know, find new friends in the area, and so that, and then on his side, he's got the stress of his job, and so it could be a matter of just stress and loneliness causing you to have the same dream that he had described to you the night before. Well, thank you, Doctor, for your calm manner. It, it has eased me greatly, and I will look into the, your suggestions, and uh, hopefully we can get it fixed, because I don't... Did you say that your husband eats the same meal every single night? Yeah, always. He wants a cut of beef, roast. He never eats the vegetables, just the beef. And, uh, I mean, I know, I, you know, I have always thought if we left all the cooking up in the world to men, that's all they would eat was salt and meat. But, you know, it does seem a little unusual. Yes, that does seem unusual. All right, when popping. These, oh, go ahead, the, When did the dreams start, exactly? Well, it was maybe three or four days after I ate that first button, so it well, would have been a day earlier for my husband. Well, I do recommend that you encourage your husband to eat more veg. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good to only eat meat. All of the world's medical professionals agree. 
All right, so popping back over to Mr. Monroe, uh, as you stand before Detective Nichols, who seems thoroughly confused at your suggestion about some unclean piece of meat. Yeah, he's just sort of looking at you blankly. And I'll I'll point to the to the spot in the roast that is missing that he had he had pulled off the piece and and swallowed. It. I said the the piece that you just ate. I I can understand you wanting to to eat the roast. It was quite delicious, but the piece that you had just eaten was still quite covered in the fluids from your your wife's incident. Uh, was it now? I don't seem to remember eating it at all. I, I must express my concern for your well-being, sir. You you seem to be quite out of sorts in comparison to the other times that we've met at the at the order. Is everything all right, sir? Oh, I understand I that there's quite a bit of stress with your wife, but is there anything else? No, I'm quite all right. I haven't been sleeping as well these last couple nights, but aside from that, right as rain. And you would... If you're going to pry further, he's a, a little bit more reserved than Fiona, so it would require some social skill to overcome that. Or maybe a strange dark power given to you by an elder god. <laughs> How about Whichever we try way <laughs> the persuade first? Okay, go for it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and persuade him. And say, we've already begun an investigation on your behalf in a matter that, that could be quite harmful not only to you, but as well as you and your career, but ourselves and our being as well. You can trust me. Well, it's, you know, more that that I'm not sleeping well. It's that I keep having the same damned dream every night. And, and I don't know why it wakes me up. I don't know how a place can really, you know, cause such apprehension in me enough to wake me out of a deep sleep. But it does every night, same time or near as I can tell, you know, between two and three o'clock. I, I don't understand it, but there you have it, Mr. Monroe. Does that mean anything? I mean, I know you are more versed in strange and weird phenomena than I am. Well, uh, the fact that it's a reoccurring dream every single night typically means something at the very least. Could you describe the dream to me? Well, yeah, I'm uh, standing in a field. You know, I'm not, can't say precisely where, but off in the distance is a low hill or a mound. And uh, before it, is a windmill, and really that's it. And I don't, you know, I don't move, I don't do anything, I just stand there and I look on this scene and and then this dread grows and grows and grows until, you know, I wake with a start and I'm drenched in sweat and it takes me several hours, if at all, to get back to sleep. Hmm. And you say that this is a place you've never been before and you don't recognize anything of the area? No, I'd, I mean, I can say... The land is flat. I don't see any terrain in the far distance. Uh, the only change in the terrain is this mound, or maybe like a hundred yards away, and the and the windmill is half the distance. Hmm, that is quite interesting. From the field, can you tell whether, in 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 any way or terms, can you tell about what, whether it may be in America or perhaps another country? The the windmill. I'm just trying to glean any. Any details that might that might help me here? Well, that's my sense of it. You know, it looks like, you know, photographs, your pictures I've seen of out west, you know, out beyond the Mississippi, certainly. Okay. So similar to a scrubland or the yeah, I waving would say grasses so. or the midlands? Okay. Yeah, the uh the vegetation that grows is is the hardy variety that mm. can grow with little rain, you know, but it is all over the ground. And at least in my dream state of it, it's there is some green around, so it's not completely barren. But uh, yeah, that's really all I can, all all that I bring to mind, which isn't that difficult to do. It just it doesn't fade like other dreams have a tendency to do. Hmm. Well, perhaps this this location has some point of significance. Would you mind doing me a favor, sir? And perhaps. Asking someone who has been in those regions of any kind of... You said that there was a, a low hill or a, a mound of some sort that may be a defining feature in that area that someone may recognize. Would you mind trying to see if that place actually exists? Oh, I can't guarantee anything, but I will I will see what I can look up. Yes, yes. I, I, I understand that it's not much to go on, but, but I'll, I'll do the same while I am 
I'm investigating other areas. All right, so let's bounce away from you guys and check in with Mr. Whitmire briefly. Mr. Whitmire, could you roll a 1d10 for me? Well, it's not wanting to roll. Give me just a second. Yeah, no problem. No, no excuses. Okay, so that's how long in hours your temporary bout of madness uh, lasts. So you come to in the hallway of the Omni Parker Hotel, and you're hammering at the door to a room that is not your own, and you have no idea why you're doing that. Okay. I'll, uh, well, first thing, I'll look around, see if anybody's actually watching me. Someone has down the hall poked their head out of their room, and they're, when they see, when you guys make eye contact, he's, uh, hey there, sir, are you all right? What's with the racket? I'll, uh, hmm. I got, I'll fast talk my, try and fast talk my way out of it. Uh, something about, uh, you know, law enforcement, special investigation, you know, go back in your room for your own safety. <laughs> As, uh, I'm not saying it so that he can hear everything, because those are the parts that I want him to be able to hear, though. Yeah. Well, he says, uh, uh, sorry, officer, and he goes back in his room. Yeah, so with that, I'll take another look around. Yeah, and you think uh, the room with which you were banging on must be unoccupied because you don't hear any movement. You don't uh, hear, or nobody comes to the door after 30 seconds or so. Okay. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll try and kind of creep away <laughs> quietly <laughs> back to my yes. own room. So by the, nu- the number on the door of the room you were banging on, you know it's just down the hall from where you are, like around an elbow. So you go around that one to your room, which the door stands wide open. And as you enter, you can see that dresser mirror has been shattered into many tiny fragments. Okay. So now I was going to cover a... it up if it hadn't been. <laughs> you are in a state of uh, underlying insanity, which means any further sanity loss can put you into a new bout of madness. And also you are prone to delusions. So given that fact, what are you going to do once you're back in your room? Well, um, I was going to pack up and go find a different hotel. <laughs> All right. Well, so uh, with that regular spot hidden roll. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was going <laughs> to use it <laughs> for you to see something horrible. But yeah, you um, you walk into your room. You see the damaged mirror, which you must have done yourself. Uh, you, there are tiny you know, glinting reflections, which you shudder at, but luckily you can't make out what the reflections are because the pieces are so small, but they still make your hairs rise and you gather up your things hurriedly and uh, flee the Omni Parker Hotel. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I will will, um, leave some cash like on the dresser or something. Yeah, a rough estimate to cover the expenses. Yeah. Okay. All right, James Whitmire, you flee the hotel in search of another, and you're how do you how do you walk through this street? Do you feel a little harried? Are you speed walking or jogging? Um, no, I'm. I mean, I, I don't think that I'm going uh, quickly. I'm. I would say average speed. It's just because I'm trying to sort through what what happened, right? So, um, you know, paying a little bit less attention to the surroundings as I usually would uh, and trying not to draw any type of of attention. Yeah, I would say that feeling that you have is probably sort of a natural state from what we've come to know of Mr. Whitmire. He always seems to have people suspicious of him or after him. So (laughs) what difference does it make if it's a strange cosmic entity? But you are walking through the streets of Boston and as you've had some time to gather your wits about you, you do notice there are small cuts on your hands from when you destroyed the mirror in your room. And you have to pause at an intersection for a trolley to pass. And you can kind of envision that old style trolley that goes down the middle of the road on its track. And uh, it has, you know, windows running around the around the center portion of it. And you just happen to catch your reflection in one of these windows, and you see that dark figure a few paces behind you. But then the trolley cars passed, and 
you don't see the reflection anymore. And what's left in your mind is the warning echo from Wilhelm von Junts. Woe to they that look upon the great horned one. What do you do? Um, well, and I'll, I'll continue, uh, continue on my way to the hotel, uh, avoiding any reflective surfaces, or at least avoiding looking into any reflective sur- surfaces. Okay. Yeah, that makes it uh, your journey somewhat difficult, but not impossible as at this stage, modern constructions have started to have more and more glass, although there's not really the mirrored glass too often yet, although mostly it's just the sun is starting to go down enough that where it's behind a building, you can get to these dark spots and you pick up your reflection in the street lights on this glass and whatnot, but you keep your eyes averted to it and you head to another hotel and in a blur, you know, you you don't even quite remember setting up the arranging the room, paying for it, unless there's something specific you want about the room, Mr. Yes, Whitmire. as I am okay. willing to pay extra for them to take out any any mirrors that can be removed or cover up uh, yeah. ones that cannot. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the hotel clerk looks at you a little oddly, and it was when he there was does... a little bit of force to the request, but he does. So oh, we can do that. We'll have it uh, moved out uh, before you get up there. Yeah, so we'll let a little bit of the madness seep through in the <laughs> look that I give him, <laughs> giving the request. And no mirrors! <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, he just says, you'll just have to wait down here in the lobby for a moment, and I'll, we'll have a couple of men um, remove that mirror. That's all. And, uh, all thank so you. yeah, there you are waiting. And um, when you gathered your things, did you... Grab nameless cults and put it back into your jacket. Yes, because it was. Okay. Uh, I figure it was more of a unconscious thing because. Yeah. I typically I don't like to leave things. You know. Yeah, and you you just feel it there now that you have time to idle, and uh, it seems so inconsequential now that you're you know ca- not caught in the narrative. You know, it's just such a cheaply made paperback. Like, how could such a thing occur? But we will bounce back over to Mr. Monroe and Dr. Andrews as uh, Detective Nichols and his wife are becoming more forceful at getting you to depart, although they stop short of being rude. So this will allow any further questions you guys might have. Uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Andrews. Uh, no, uh, I don't have any further questions. And what about you, Mr. Monroe? No further questions, but I do want to convey that, you know, I am concerned about his health in addition to his wife's health and tell him that when he takes her to the doctor that he should probably also have himself checked out, that his diet of late is perhaps not the healthiest for either mind or body. Well, perhaps I will do just that, Mr. Monroe. I appreciate your concern truly, and I also appreciate your help. In this matter, um, I'll look into those things and I'll and I'll get that information back to you, gentlemen, as soon as I can. Uh, we appreciate the dinner or coming to the dinner, and we're sorry how everything turned out. We wish you a good night. And with that, you're you know you're outside of their converted large rambling farmhouse, awaiting a cab to take you back to Boston. And by the powers of a, a keeper, you guys are in the cab. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a silent cab ride or if you guys wanted to have any conversation now that you're back together and in relative privacy. Yeah, I'll I'll bring up what happened. Well, let's see. Is, is there the, like, the glass divide between us and the cabbie or? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, if, if he can't, like, hear us very well, I'll I'll kind of, in a whisper, discuss what happened in the kitchen. And then I was... W- concerned about the detective yes me i'm concerned as well because his wife confided to me that for the past several weeks he's eaten the same meal every single night just the pot roast and so that makes both of them have odd dietary issues and that's a little concerning to me and but that's the weirdest thing i've ever seen well it's not the weirdest thing I've ever seen, but it's pretty odd. And then this this matter of the the dreams that they are 
both having you, you did you mention that uh she was having the same dream yeah 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 she uh, said she started having it after he described his dream to her okay yeah i'll uh i'll mention that that disturbs me quite a bit uh one of the things that actually bothers me about it is after i'd had him thoroughly describe the area it's the same part of america that the small idol that i had found on his fireplace came from oh and, that ugly frog yes and uh it concerns me that it it just randomly showed up on his desk and then a few days later they began having these dreams and odd behaviors now i don't know if it's fully correlated, but uh, after some of the things that had happened down in Peru, I I feel like I must, at the very least, look into it. Yeah, I, I think we should, because it's an odd coincidence. Yes, and from what I've seen, I, I don't really believe in coincidences like this magnitude much anymore. Yeah, it's just too coincidental for both of them to be having these same issues. I must admit, things are, are beginning to get a little bit concerning. Uh, the messages from, uh, oh, I forgot the Chris's character's name. Johan Muller. Johan Muller, yeah. The the message from Muller, and then you being approached to leave off the case, and Whitmire being told to leave off the case, and I, as far as I can tell, I'm the only one that hasn't had anyone specifically come to me and tell me to stop. It, all of these things together are beginning to concern me greatly. Yes, they concern me as well, um, because obviously there's some corruption taking place here. And the, what was his name? Frank, F.W. Francis Walsh. Yeah, Francis Walsh. He sounds to me, and if he's involved with trying to get us off the case, he sounds to me like a dangerous person to cross I wonder if he's a well-known person that perhaps our friend uh, Mr. Or Dr. Call would would know. Perhaps we could find out a little bit more about the man. I mean, they are both attorneys. Yeah, to be clear, there was a separation of individuals between who signed the check and who left the note with it. Uh, a lawyer by the name of Frank Bellencamp signed the check, while the note was signed simply F.W., and the de Detective Nichols suggested that could mean Francis Walsh, as Frank Bellencamp works for a firm that represents known associates of him. But as you're having your conversation, Dr. Andrews, you just happen to notice over the shoulder of Mr. Monroe through the window of the cab, a detail that ordinarily your mind would have filtered out, which is just three kids on bicycles, you know, traveling in the opposite direction that your cab was going as you uh, near downtown Boston. But on the back bike, on a little flag that's attached, you know, to the area behind the seat is the eye symbol described in Mr. Dooley's journal. Oh, okay. Well, I'll immediately point it out in excited fashion. Look at that bike. Yeah, so you see the same thing, Mr. Monroe, but now through the rear window of the cab. Oh, Quickly knock on the glass of the cabbie and ask him, you know, sir, could you turn around and, and uh, follow those children? Uh, they have something that I need to ask them about. Yeah, follow the children? Okay. <laughs> so he uh, turns around, not quickly at all. You know, steering isn't what we enjoy, so it's a multi-point turn, and he has to wait for a, a little bit of the on, or the, yeah, the traffic in the other lane to clear out, but eventually he gets behind them before they're too far down the road. And you follow them to uh, an empty lot, save uh, like the foundation stones of whatever structure was once there. And they've, you know, pulled up, skidded their bikes to a halt, and they've gotten out. And, you know, they look to be, be between the ages of 8 and 12, maybe. Okay. Three of them. I think we could take them. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pay the cabbie and, and, uh, step out and I'll say, I feel I must question these young men about where they saw that sign. And if you'd like to join me, you're welcome to, or we can meet up tomorrow yeah. morning. Yes. Let's go see what they have to say. All right. So you guys get out of the cab and you approach 
these three children, and they're not quite aware of your interest in them, but we will pause right there and switch over to Mr. Whitmire as he sits in the lobby of this new hotel. Um, so you're sitting there, Mr. Whitmire, with your mind racing, and uh, you hear no boot hills clicking on the lobby floor, this marble lobby floor, and you've got your head down and you're absorbed in your thoughts, and you see, you know, polished black shoes appear in your vision, and you can follow them up to see a, a well-dressed individual in a black suit with a broad-brimmed hat, you know, not not like the ones you were on the lookout for down in Peru, but in the vein of a fedora, but a little bit larger and, and made of more of a cloth-like material. And um, he speaks, Mr. Whitmire, you are a difficult man to find. What do you do? So, uh, instinctively, my hand will go to my pocket, um, looking for the, uh, hold on, let me look at which one it was. Aren't you the, carrying uh, 38. Oh, the 38? Okay. Yeah. As well, well were yeah, you, you thinking that I was... I know you had, you were carrying, uh, Nicholas Sacito's 1911 as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hmm. Um. But a, th a 38 might be better. Yeah. As uh, I mean, I, I think that I would have, I, I probably smaller. would be, yeah, carrying that. But yeah, that's, so a hand goes to the pocket, grip that, that uh, 38, and uh, I'll, um, so I'll, I'll flash a smile at this stranger and say, uh, uh, hey, bud, do I know you? No, but we know you, well... More particularly, we know of the organization to which you belong, the Society for the Exploration of the Unexplained. And uh, can you give me a hard spot hidden roll? Yes. He says, my name is Mr. Blackman. and But that makes your hair stand up all over again. But the, what you notice with your spot hidden is as you're in the interior of a building and the lights are mostly around the counter area, he casts a long shadow against the front entrance wall, and there is something very wrong about this shadow, as it does not seem to reflect the shape of the man. In fact, the arms are long, almost seeming to stretch down to the ground as his feet do. The head is triangular in shape, and give me a sanity roll. Oh. Okay, no sanity is lost, and... uh Yes, he says, my name is Mr. Blackman, and we know of the Society of the Exploration, the Ex, <laughs> damn that name. <laughs> we know of your society, and we have great interest in it, particularly your activities in Boston. And as I understand it, you're a man who can obtain objects of interest, and I will pay you the sum of $200 if you are able to obtain a small bauble we believe to be lost somewhere in Boston. So when he says his name, I'll, uh, you know, bark a short laugh and, uh, you know, listening to him that he just wants me to acquire some goods. Uh, it'll, you know, I'll ease just a little bit and uh, ask him, you know, where where is it and what does it look like? It is a little thing. A locket with a picture of a woman in it. It's made of silver. Its last known whereabouts were on the grounds of a now defunct church called the Church of Contemplation and Our Lord, Granter of Secrets. My organization is interested in recovering artifacts from this church, and thanks to your organization, we've already made much headway in that regard. Do you accept? Yeah, I'll see if I could find your necklace. This is the address of a bank. You are instructed to leave it at this safety deposit box. And he hands you a slip of paper with that information on it, which proves to be a bank here in Boston. Okay. Was, uh, so I'll yeah I'll I'll take it and I'll you know flip open the uh, slip of paper, look at the address, and uh, stuff it in my pocket. Time is a factor here, Mr. Whitmire, so we would appreciate your haste in the matter. Have a good day. 
and he goes to turn away and walk away. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll let him go. As uh, my does that does that shadow act yeah, normally? Once you've cottoned onto it, you're somewhat transfic transfixed by it. There's something serpent like in the way it falls on the far wall. Okay. But then he's out of the building. Yeah, these weirdos. But <laughs> uh, it, it may may grant me other opportunities. So, uh, is there a um, like? Do they have any maps or anything in here, like of the city? Yeah, you could request one. Okay. Yeah, I was, I'll I'll get one. And I'll I'll ask the guy. Um, well, actually, I'll uh, I'll start looking at the maps first and see if I could find any. Mind. Did did he give me any idea of where that church was? Um, he didn't give you, or is it written down? Address. Sorry, but you you are familiar with the SEU reports having to do with it. So, uh, where your token is, did that map load in properly for you guys? I've been avoiding using it because it's a pretty big file size, and sometimes it doesn't always work right. Uh, yeah, it loaded fine for me. Okay. Yep. So those pins off, um, to the right of your perspective on your token there, James, are some of the points of interest that you've been interested in. And you can see the Church of Contemplation and Our Lord Granter of Secrets. Okay. Is, uh, the the tooltip pops up with that information. But you also have the Corbett House, uh, Mr. Dooley's Fine Cigars, and Mr. Dooley's House, which is all information that your character was interested in based off of what you had said he was planning to do. Um, yeah, so... You know, right? You you're able to pinpoint it um, on the map he gives you, and you know it's maybe like uh, an hour or two walk, or a shorter amount of time if you take public transportation. So what I would also you like to know do? What they found down there, though? What did they find? Was, uh, maybe I'm thinking of the Corbett House, but I I thought that they went to the church afterwards. I'll have to go back and look at the journal from that other investigator. Well, the hotel attendant approaches you while you're looking over the map, and he informs you that your room is ready. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll thank him and at least go set my stuff down. Okay. So, jumping over to Dr. Andrews and Mr. Monroe, you um, approach these three boys as they stand outside this uh, derelict property whose only, whose only structural remains is some of the foundation wall. And uh, what would you like to do? Well, <clears throat> probably start out by hailing him. Young men, young men, uh, may I ask you a few questions really really quick? Yeah, so the uh, older of the two, or the three, sorry, he kind of puts himself between you and the two younger boys, and he's like, uh, who's asking? Oh, no one, no one in particular, just a, a passerby who noticed that you were playing in this area and noticed the uh, the flag that you happen to have on the back of your bike, and I wanted to ask you a few questions about it. Uh, that's not my flag. That's my little brother's flag, and I don't know why he carries it on his bike. Well, may I ask your little brother a question about it? Mm, I don't... Well, you can, but he took a fastball to the side of the head. He really doesn't speak that well. Well, that that's immaterial to the question. I I just wish to ask him where he saw it, or why he has it on the back of his his bike, and any answer that I can get from him would would be most helpful. Yeah, while you're talking to the older boy, uh, the younger one who had the flag has, you know, ditched his bike, and he started walking onto the grounds, you know, ignorant of the conversation you two are having, and he starts uh, walking in a circle, like maybe 12 feet in diameter, and he's uh, saying... A bit of rhyme that you're all familiar with. It's uh, like uh, sim- Simple Simon. Y- y- are you guys familiar with that rhyme? Mm, no. Nope. No. Okay. So the, the bits that you hear are like, Simple Simon met a pie man going to the fair. Says Simple Simon to the pie man, Pray let me taste your wares. And on it goes. But then it, it sort of fades as he reaches the far uh, part of the circle because you can't quite hear it very well. But yeah, so he kind of he kind of looks at the older kid, you know, says, oh, yeah, have at it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you guys aren't like a couple of weirdos, are you? Of course we're weirdos, but trust me, you have nothing to fear from us. 
And Dr. Andrews, for your part, you've been, you know, watching and taking in these three boys while Monroe does the talking. And you can see the older one has the makings of a future bruiser should he go down that path. You know, he's the biggest. Uh, he has some somewhat of a mean look about him, but maybe that's brought on by the necessity of his life. While the middle kid who's just sitting there by his bike with a notebook in his hand, he's, you know, looking to the older one to see what he's supposed to do. And then you watch the youngest kid, you know, walk off and start his little march in a circle. Are you um, going to leave the, the talking to Mr. Monroe? Well, yeah, but um, as far as like with this older kid, but I do want to go get closer to Simple Simon and see if I can start some communication with him. Yeah, sure. So like I, I can recognize then that this kid's he's like he's slow. Or... Yeah, well, you heard the older boy say something about taking a fastball to okay. the the side of the head, which is yeah. actually you have you you when you practiced in the states, you had personal experience with a case like that. Only in your case, you were unable to save the patient; they actually died of the resulting swelling from right. the strike. Yeah, so you you edge around a little bit closer, and uh, you catch on. Um, a part of the slumping foundational wall, that eye symbol again, painted in white, although it's chipped and faded. Mm -hmm. And once again, that's three Ys arranged in a triangle so that the top elements of each Y touch the other two Ys. And in the center is the staring eye. But give me a listen roll. Just him or? Yeah, just uh, Dr. Andrews. Okay. So yeah, this is a pretty common rhyme. And while... You guys might not be aware of it in real life. It, your character is, for the time, you know, it was just one of the number of rhymes that you would pick up on the schoolyard and, and forever after it was imprinted on your brain. And uh, so, you know, it goes, Simple Simon met a pie man going to the fair, says Simple Simon to the pie man, pray, let me taste your wares. Says the pie man to Simple Simon, show me first your penny. Says Simple Simon to the pie man, indeed, I have not any. And from that point, usually it just loops around in, in a, the annoying way that kids can do that forever and ever. But um, this kid seems to have made a, a few more verses, and they go like this. Says the pie man to Simple Simon, then to me you must hark. Says Simple Simon to the pie man, here I stand awaiting your remark. Says the pie man to Simple Simon, dig, dig, for in the dark I lie. Says Simple Simon to the pie man, anything if it but fetch me a pie. And then he'll loop back around to the beginning as he makes his circle around this 12-foot diameter area. Mr. Monroe, what's your move? So, seeing that Dr. Andrews is already there, at, at first I'll just kind of observe. Um, but then, you know, eventually ask the, the young man that's walking the circle... Young man, I was wondering if I could ask you about that flag and the symbol that you have on your bike. He looks at you for a moment. He stops his march and his rhyme, uh, but then continues down to it. And you see um, not necessarily a lack of intelligence, but uh, just that your speaking didn't spark anything off in his eyes. You know, he didn't, he didn't react to it. And he returns to his little march. And the older boy says, yeah, that's... Uh, that's Simon for you. He's not going to say anything besides that stupid rhyme. I mean, sometimes he says yes or no questions Ma asks him, but it's just that rhyme over and over and over again. I mean, we're lucky if he doesn't say it when we go to sleep. But if you want to know, he got the symbol from what's painted on the wall right there. I don't know why he always takes us to this place all the time. I can't stand it. It just gives me the creep. And as he says that, you are aware of a tingling sensation, both you and Dr. Andrews, growing at your temples as though it is the signal of an oncoming headache. Okay. So what do you say? What do you do? Sorry. Um, I'm going to go investigate around the wall. Where the... Where, um, kind of try and figure out what kind of a building this is, um, what it may have been, if there was perhaps a basement or anything to it. Yeah, you can see um, that that is exactly the case. It was a rather large building. You can see a part of what looks like just the ground. There's a hole there where a long time ago, um, Joseph 
or Vincent Newell fell into it uh, and uh, nearly hurt himself. Screamed like a little girl, if I remember correctly. But yeah, so you can see this opening where, to where there was an old basement and there's broken furniture down there and whatnot. Okay. And he says, yeah, we didn't, the, the older kid, he's like, we didn't paint that symbol. It was some other, some older men, I guess, boys. I don't know. All you guys look way old to me. So do we recognize this place um, either from uh, journals or anything from the SEU investigations? Yeah, I'd say there's enough there if you guys have read those details. It was yeah. an option you could take at character creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read I read through them um, yeah. a couple of times, I think, actually. Yeah, so in your case, Andrews, by seeing the wall painting, you can put it together. Uh, same with you, Mr. Monroe. Okay. Um, well, I'll this, come. Okay. Go. This boy made up a uh, made up his own verse to this rhyme, and uh, and it's about digging down. And here we have a hole, so perhaps it's connected. Well, under normal circumstances, I would express caution. Perhaps now is a good time for us to uh, maybe be a, a a slight bit more adventurous. Um, I'll I'll kind of look at the young man and and knowing that he can sometimes say yes or no, I'll I'll ask him, "Are we supposed to dig here?" Uh, give me a social skill roll. Yeah, uh, I'll um I'll I'll look at the boy and say, "Is the pie man down here?" All right. Yeah, your um your altering of the language will afford you a a bonus die on your social skill roll, Doctor Andrews. Okay. Social skills does uh, which exactly do those? It'd be charm, uh, persuade, uh, intimidate, or fast talk. Have to be a persuade. So yeah, as I'm I'm saying it, I'll I'll kind of point to the circle that he's walking around and point to the middle and kind of make some motions as shoveling as as I talk to him and ask him, "Are we supposed to <laughs> dig here?" Lucky for that bonus. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. So you both succeeded. Um, your manner, your normal. I think you realize, Mister Monroe, that your uh, showmanship is lost on children, perhaps, or you alter it in such a way, and then, you know, uh, Doctor Andrews summons all of his bedside manner and the, you know, like the tenderness with which you might handle someone in this state, and the two of you together get a yes out of him, you know, and the older boy's like, yeah. hey, he only does that with mom. So does he have any any kind of response? Well, the older bo- boy is like, hey, he only does that with mom. I've never heard him say anything other than a stupid rhyme to other people. What did he say exactly? Oh, he said yes. Sorry. Okay. I guess I didn't have it toggled on. Yes, so... uh. But then he returns, marches off further down his imaginary circle, which isn't oh. actually around that caved-in bit of the basement. It's uh, maybe 15 feet. To the left of it as you guys are looking at it. Yeah. I'll look at uh, Dr. Andrews and say, well, I don't know if us digging in this exact spot will afford us much, but perhaps we can reach this location if we travel down into the tunnel yeah. that is afforded to us. Yeah, it might extend uh, under underneath. At the very least, we can take a look, and if we need to come back with uh, actual digging implements, then, then we can come yeah. back with, with some assistance. Yeah, couldn't hurt to take a look. As for the uh, the boys, I'll look at the older boy and I'll say, we need to take a look at something in the basement here. And I'll pull out a dollar. I'll say, if you will keep a, a watch and if we don't come back up in, in the next half hour or so, then uh, go to, and I'll pull out a, one of my flyers. I'll say, go to this location and seek help from my assistant. Okay. He's like, ah, you got it, sir. Ethan, he addresses the middle boy. Uh, go post up over there. The great knights are on it, he says. And you can gather that maybe that's the name of their particular little group of friends or whatever. And they he expertly takes the dollar from me, which in this era is most likely, you know, a silver dollar. And, yeah. you, and he uh, heads off in some direction. And you guys can get down into that basement area with, little difficulty and once down there you see you know some odd ceremonial type accoutrements like 
you know, candle holders, those sorts of things uh, amidst the wreckage of this broken furniture. And a quick examination of the ground gives you the idea that it would be difficult to hand dig it out. You would at least, at least need a, a shovel or something like that. Okay. But let's uh, pop back over to Whitmire as he's dropped his things off in his room. What's going to be your next move? Well, I mean, no time like the present. So, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, drop some things in the room and I will uh, start heading out to the church. I am going to tuck away that uh, 1911 along with the uh, 38 this time, though. Okay. Um... And all the while heading to this church, I'll be uh, running through my head is how do you give the god a slip <laughs> or the slip? Right, yeah, so you uh, make your way to this church trying to puzzle out how that is done, and you really don't have anything to latch on to because, you know, to understand that, you might you need to understand what a god might do or what they might want, and that's something you really haven't sussed out of your experiences since Peru. But as you know you're nearing the church and you, you come upon its grounds, uh, a kid who would you guess would be around 10, 11, or 12 like jumps from behind a low wall and he's like, "Hey, where are you going, Mister?" And he gives you a start. So I'll uh, I'll catch myself before uh, you know go the hand going to the um, pocket where that thirty eight's at, <laughs> and I'll uh, <laughs> hey, you never know out here, man. <laughs> Kid could be a god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'll uh, yeah you know startled. Hand goes, tries to go to the pocket, and so, oh, was, uh, what time is it right now? So it's probably about seven thirty or eight. Okay, so yeah, I'll, you know, it's getting kind of late. Was, uh, what are you doing around here? Well, this is uh, this is where we're hanging out. We're we're hanging out because this area is dangerous, and you want to be avoiding it. You want to go <laughs> far south, and then he inexplicably whistles something like he's trying to mimic a bird. Okay, I'll uh, I'll reach in into my uh, pocket and pull out uh, a couple dollars. I'll say, <laughs> so what what can you tell me about the dangers around here? Because I'm not giving them to him yet, but I am letting him see it. Okay. Uh, he says, well, it's uh, you know, there's a it was a construction area and the ground isn't settled and um, there's snakes, venomous mm -hmm. snakes. That you want to be on the lookout for, so it's best to to go down two blocks and then and then travel around. I'll ask him uh, if he's you know do you, you pretty familiar with the uh, the church that was here or the where it used to be? Uh, I don't know about any church. And then he whistles again. And uh, for Doctor Andrews and Mister Monroe, you've heard this strange whistle, unlike any bird you've ever heard, go off twice now. Okay. Um... A little bit confused, I, I I guess I'll head back up to kind of see what's going on and kind of try to discreetly peek my head up to see what's going on. So yeah, you see the older boy talking to none other than Slick Jim Whitmire. Can I do a spot hidden to try and see? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Do I have an opposed roll? Do you Are you trying to, to hide? Oppose it? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be kind of sneaky and yeah. Well, roll your stealth. It, it's going to be horrible, but where is stealth? There it is. Yeah. So <laughs> I just kind of walk up. <laughs> well, that and he's also wearing a very uh, brilliantly colored suit. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Which picks up the fading sunlight, dazzles your eyes. Yeah, it's got LED lights on it. <laughs> he's like a UFO. Admirer, so it's like <laughs> they're blinking. <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> nice. But yes, you pick up uh, none other than uh, Mr. Monroe, who's kind of clambering out of a hole partially to get a look at what's going on. <laughs> I am All right. That well, played out yeah. perfectly. <laughs> I'll uh, exclaim then. So I was, oh. I, I've been watching around, like trying to keep a lookout for whoever this kid was whistling for. Because it's pretty obvious that he he was uh, trying to whistle for backup. But when I see uh, Lance Monroe there, I'll start laughing. 
and I'll uh, I'll you know flick one of the dollars to the kid and uh, start walking. Hey, past sir, and... what about what about the snakes? I was uh, just yeah, I was asking like, hey, did you find a way inside of there, Lance? Well, I'll say, well, we found a way down. Uh, as for inside, there's quite a bit of it that's been collapsed. Did you drive your vehicle here? Yeah. Well, you could give me a luck roll that you happen to have some implement in your trunk that would help. And any, all right. I think I got it. <laughs> so here's I've got a backhoe set. towed behind yeah. my truck or my behind my car. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, three shovels, you know, ropes, uh, a stick of dynamite, and <laughs> we'll call and prob- it there. <laughs> probably a bag of lime as well. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So seeing that they didn't bring anything. I'll shake my head and say, Kez, what would you do without me? And well, we, we had not intended on being here. Uh, fate, as it were, or chance, brought us. And I'll uh, pat the bag of digging tools and other items and say, that's why he always, he's always got to be ready. Yeah, so um, with a better ability to dig, uh, a few more details for you, Whitmire, as you see off a little distance from this collapsed basement, you know, one boy walking in a circle, you chanting a little rhyme over and over again, and you pick it up as the simple Simon rhyme. And uh, beyond that, the middle aged, the middle age of the three boys sits down and he starts writing something in his notebook. And then the older boy is like, so do you all still need that lookout? I'll, uh, I'll tell him, yeah. And I'll, uh, let him know that that other that other dollar is for when we're done. Okay. All right. So there's no role required for the digging. It's just a matter of time. And after a few hours, just as the older boy, who by now you understand his name to be Bill, comes up and he says, "Hey, we got to be getting home. Our mom should be getting off her shift. Are you guys almost done?" And you have this breakthrough into a buried chamber. So there's. Like, you, you could dig it out a little bit and, and actually all walk inside of it, if you wish. Um, yeah? Yeah, I don't really feel like crawling through any holes. <laughs> actually, uh, Dr. Andrews and Mr. Monroe, would you give me a psychology role? We'll just see if you pick up on Mr. Whitmire's insane state. That he's, yeah. Um, oh, I was, I was way too far. Yeah, so to you, Mr. Monroe, um, Whitmire's always had that hunted look about him, which he continues to this very moment. And same with you, Mr. Andrews, Dr. Andrews. But yeah, so you have a opening that you can fit into if you wish. Well, that since I'm in my, my dinner clothes, I'd prefer to widen it a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I'd, well, I would opt to widen it just a little bit. Uh, I don't want to get stuck in there with whatever we're about to find. Uh, you were going to say something, Dr. Andrews? Yeah, I'll push through. All right. So, yeah, you push into the dark interior whose only light is a shaft of of uh, the fading sunlight that comes into this hole you've opened. So you would need some alternative light source if you are to get a better look in here. Okay. Well, I, I think... don't have anything. Did uh, Yeah, um, Whitmire's, Whitmire's probably got it. To... Yeah, yeah okay. and if, if he's starting to push through, and that will definitely change my... Cause I, I am here for something as well, right? Uh, so I want to make sure that I'm I'm going to be the one that gets it. So I'll I'll uh, hand him a light before he goes in and push in right after him. Okay. So yeah, with that light, you know, you had a, an electric torch, one of the newer models. Works pretty good. Still not as good as a good old-fashioned lantern, but you throw the beam across the interior and it there's a, a little of apparent interest except for a small altar upon which rests a small stone idol of a squat, pot-bellied, toad-like creature. Not quite the mirror image of the one you've just received, um, Mr. Monroe, but of, you know, it was made by a different artist, but probably the same, the same culture, if not a different time period. And, and like I said, it's... the same, the same subject. Right. And this, um, this small altar actually rests on a a larger base that's, you know, maybe about seven feet long. And I will take a spot hidden or mechanical repair roll 
from the two that are in that area. So Dr. Andrews and Mr. Whitmire. And I'll be continuing to try and widen the entrance as they're, they're down there. All right, we'll give the nod to Dr. Andrews. So hold on just a sec. Dean has busted in. We're almost done here. One sec. <laughs> he busted through your uh, your daddy gate? No, just into the room. He oh. <laughs> actually brought me like a little, uh, he found some little toad-like uh, clay figure <laughs> that he brought to me when I was working on this the other day. It was kind of alarming. Uh, <laughs> um, I think there's something you need to <laughs> consider right. here. But uh, okay, so back to it. All right, so yeah, um, we'll give the nod to Dr. Andrews. Um, you realize that this actually is a cleverly disguised, you know, coffin or sarcophagus of some kind, and you actually even see that there's a rudimentary mechanical release system for sliding the al- altar off. Yeah, um, yeah. So that'll be exciting to me. So I'll uh, point that out in the process of opening it. Yeah. So hey, hey, look what you got here is a, a sar- sarcophagus, and it opens like this. Yeah. So it starts to slide you know, on ancient mechanical workings, but then it stops about halfway, but enough to reveal the unsettling sight of a pair of ancient and dry corpse legs, which does not phase you, good Dr. Andrews, because you're accustomed to looking at corpses in various states, but you, Mr. Whitmire, on the other hand, will have to pass a sanity roll. Seen worse. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the shutter... a few hours ago, I saw a lot worse. You both realize that uh, it'll take a little bit more work to get this mechanism either to go the rest of the way or maybe with good old-fashioned elbow grease you could get it off. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll ask Monroe to, uh, well, I guess, do you want a luck roll to see if I had a pry bar or? No, you do. Okay, yeah, so I'll ask Monroe to, to uh, hand me the pry bar and we'll, we can try and uh, unstick that mechanism. Did you find something down have... there? Uh, looks like a coffin and this weird frog thing. I'll be right I'll, back. I'll describe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, I'll start I'll, describing I'll it r- until it <laughs> runs off. I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, I'm super excited at this point. So yeah, he passes you the crowbar after he he gets it, and you guys oh, have I'm it. Gonna, which I mean, I'm gonna head down up? there this time. Okay. So yeah, then Mr. Uh, so yeah, you come in and you've got the crowbar and you've got it in your hands and you're excited and you see the dry corpse legs. Please give me a sanity roll. <laughs> nice. Yep. Fascinating once again, not disgusting or yep. unnerving. <laughs> um, so with the pry bar, uh, one of you working at it has to pass with a bonus die, either a hard strength roll or a regular mechanical repair roll. I've got mechanical repair. Do you want me to use that? You can all go for it, um, so that we have the most amount of successes. But you, you, how do you basically you want bonus die? You roll it after. There's under the roll. You see where it says bonus penalty. Well, Whitmire's got it. If you guys are happy to let him muscle in there, yeah. Okay. Okay. So with the compartment opened, you see a wizened corpse, partially clothed in a mostly decomposed, dirty robe. But about him are various artifacts that he's been buried with. And just as you are, you know, trying to look at those things, the eyes of this corpse snap open, casting the most ghastly shade of yellow you have ever seen in your life. A sanity roll from all three of you, please. Oh, jeez. <sighs> Ooh, a close one. Ooh. Jeez, man. Almost lost. I was, stuff I was there. Pre- I was apparently prepared for it. Yeah, you. Well, this is what you always hoped for. Yeah, I'm <laughs> secretly like, <laughs> please open your eyes. <laughs> so much to ask about. All right. So, because you are becoming hardened mythos veteran, it doesn't have the effect it might have once had, but it does cause you each to lose one point of sanity. So, for you, Doctor Andrews and uh, Mister Monroe, you can act in whichever surprised fashion you wish. Like, how would Andrews respond to that? Jump in Jehoshaphat. And you, Mr. Monroe? I'll just say, huh, as I step behind Mr. Whitmire to put him between me and the corpse. But in your case, Mr. Whitmire, 
who has in the state of underlying insanity, any further sanity loss puts you into a bout of madness, which you go into now, and you yell, the black man, the black man, the black man. And on that note, we will end today's session. Thanks for playing, guys. Nice ending. Nice. Thank you, Travis. That was really good. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. All right, let's get those. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get those luck rolls and skill increases out there. If you're. This has been a Death Watch production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.